I touched on this idea in my video discussing the many mutants that pop up in the franchise, but something I really enjoy about Ben 10, particularly the classic series, is the wide variety of characters with sort of out there and unique abilities and origins. In the classic especially, we see all sorts, like an Aztec God of Death, a secret organization of knights, as well as various mutants, all the topic of today's video, the several magic users of the franchise. Which was a group of people with a few more members than I'd remember when I first came up with this topic. I'll be saving the strangest one till last. So the idea of magic was first introduced in the episode Lucky Girl, where we're introduced to what at this point felt like the origin of all things magic with the charms of Bazell, along with what ends up being Gwen's spellbook, as well as Hex's staff of ages. Along with our first character capable of magic, well at least at this point with Hex, and later down the track his niece Charmcaster. These two are such a great example of how the world of the classic series just feels lived in. The two of them don't feel like they just popped into existence for the sake of whatever they happen to be doing that episode. They feel like they've been around for a while, only added to by their dynamic. Beyond that, we're given a lot more of their backstories in the following series. Starting off with Hex Who, we get sort of two very distinct iterations of, being what we see in the classic series through Ultimate Alien and a version of him we see in Omniverse. Both Hex and Charmcaster are functionally refugees living on Earth after escaping a place called Leleja Domain, a realm where all magic in the universe flows through. By the time we're introduced to Hex, he's become a very power-hungry and maniacal villain, only seeking to gain more mastery over magic. While researching this and sort of thinking back on what him and Charmcaster went through, you could jump to the conclusion that maybe this power-hungry obsession is just a way of him protecting himself as well as his niece from a character we'll discuss later, Edwaja. I'll be jumping around the timeline a bit here and there to better explain the characters as they appear, but I feel the need to discuss the characters as they appear just for that little bit of added context we're given later. In the classic series especially, Hex was this superimposing figure who gave us this sort of glimpse into the world of magic, going after magical artifacts and battling against Ben Max, but particularly Gwen. We do get an especially visually spectacular fight in Hex's introductory episode in the graveyard. I just love this moment where Ben is forearm scraps this enormous stone sword and swings it against a gargoyle. Hex then makes a brief return during the Ultimate Alien Force era where he reappears capturing Gwen. After some very reasonable communication between him and Gwen, Gwen tells Hex that she's planning on rescuing Charmcaster, who at this point in the series was battling against that character I mentioned before, Edwaja. Hex, despite loving his niece, calling it a suicide mission and not helping Gwen. As much as I like this first iteration of the character, what they did with him in Omniverse gave me a lot more appreciation for him. We're first reintroduced to him in the Omniverse episode Charm School, Hex now working as a professor at the college Gwen's attending, quickly becoming Gwen's favourite teacher, revealing that he'd given all his magical artefacts over to the school in order to become a professor there. There's this great reveal when Charmcaster returns double-crossing Hex, only to find out that he's practically invincible in his library. They manage to balance this real redemption with his character while still remaining true to his roots. That, and I really like his new look and his voice especially. Enough on Hex, let's discuss who is probably the most popular magic user in Charmcaster. Quick note here, I'll be talking about Gwen here and there, since she's sort of the focal point for most all episodes where magic is involved, but I won't be going into her specifically at least in this video. Back to Charmcaster. Introduced alongside her uncle Hex in the classic series, she's another resident of Legend Domain with vastly more screen time and appearances than Hex. From the get-go, particularly in classic, her relationship with her uncle is tenuous and it's clear that she's only really looking out for herself, but they really drive home this point that Hex does not treat her right in the classic series. Like everyone else on this list, Charmcaster uses magical spells predominantly, but what I like most about her is her arsenal of magical items that she carries in her bag. She creates and throws out these clay totems that form into all sorts of mana fueled creatures with really fun designs. These are used in all sorts of ways, predominantly to overwhelm enemies. My favourite personal use of these is when she summoned them all only for them to merge with her creating the rock monster armour. I don't know if that's the official name, but that's what's on the wiki. Although she does have some cooler forms. Beyond her cool powers and arsenal, what I really find most appealing about Charmcaster is her humanity. I recently discussed Ben's love interest at length for a video, which I generally find have their moments of being well treated here and there, but the relationship between Charmcaster and Michael Morningstar was really something. In the episode Couples Retreat, Michael Morningstar or Darkstar finds his way into Ledger Domain, meaning Charmcaster. He begins to feed off of her manner. She becomes more and more attached to him while he only uses her as an energy source. There's this beautiful combination in this episode with him, referring to Gwen as a trophy while still trying to keep Charmcaster as an energy source, only for Charmcaster to ask him if he even remembers her name, Charmcaster's name being Hope, only for Michael or Darkstar to take a shot in the dark and guess, breaking her heart and having Hope drain him of all the manner he'd taken. Sometime later, during Omniverse, Charmcaster reunites with Michael and turns him into a totem. Beyond that, I really like the dynamic between her and Gwen. It's just fantastic. The two have this grudge against one another, particularly in the classic series, but their relationship develops more throughout the Ultimate Alien Force era. With the two of them joining forces and developing more of a mutual respect for one another, this all culminates in the episode Enemy of My Frenemy, where the trio helps Charmcaster only for her to sacrifice them to bring her father back, Spellbinder, our next character on this list. Although one without a lot of screen time. Spellbinder being another sorcerer from Legend Domain, he's Hex's brother and Hope's father. 
the one who sacrificed himself to help them escape from Edwasia. We'll get to him soon. Spellbinder refuses to fully return to life if it means costing the lives of others. This results in this beautiful but tragic moment for Charmcaster, with Gwen forgiving Charmcaster, just wanting her to be able to recover from the trauma of losing Spellbinder again. By the time we get to Omniverse, Charmcaster has a handful of really fun appearances. I particularly like her involvement at Gwen's College, as well as her involvement in the Galactic Monsters arc. He's popped up a few times already, so before we move on from characters from Legend Domain, let's talk about Edwasia. A character who I've had a really hard time remembering the correct spelling on more than one occasion. I'm probably not even pronouncing it right. He's a bit more one note than the other characters on this list, but his design and screen presence are really hard to compete with. He's strangely enough a member of Terraspin species, giving him a level of resistance to mana. Edwasia is considered to be the most powerful magic user in existence. He took over Ledger Domain sometime after getting a hold of the Alpha Rune, another extremely powerful magic item. After being defeated by Charmcaster, he's then turned into a totem alongside Darkstar. As far as notable appearances go, I thoroughly enjoyed his fight against Humongousaur. Moving on from Ledger Domain, we've got Verdona, Ben and Gwen's grandmother, who is pretty quickly revealed to be an anodyne. She's only in a handful of episodes, but she makes a real impression in her first appearance in the Alien Force episode, What Little Girls Are Made Of. When she returns to Earth, she meets her grandchildren along with Kevin, taking little interest in Ben who didn't inherit her anodyte genes, and instead wants to destroy Gwen's human body, freeing her anodyte form permanently. After a quick fight between them, Gwen puts Verdona in her place, explaining that her human life is important to her and that she wants to remain on Earth. For those of you who weren't aware who are still watching this point, anodites are a species of energy being who can control mana, this being the form that Gwen often takes temporarily in Alien Force and Omniverse, which nicely ties into our final magic user, Ben, or at least a version of Ben. In the episode Ben 10,000 Returns, we see the ultimate alien iteration of Ben 10,000 use magic, giving us no explanation beyond hanging around Gwen as an anodite long enough to pick up a few tricks. I've been staring at the script while writing for this video, praying that the structure makes any sense whatsoever. So if you've understood what I've been going on about despite jumping all over the place, or at least enjoyed the video, please let me know. Thanks for watching.